This video will cover DNA replication, including the chronological process, labeling directionality in replication forks, and the methods for polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. In the end, we will walk through some practice problems relating to primers and PCR. The first of these processes that we're going to go over is DNA replication in vivo, or in cells, and these are the learning objectives that we're going to be covering. They're all the ones in Unit 2.3. It's important to locate this process in time. It's not something that's happening all the time like protein production. It actually only happens during the S phase of the eukaryotic cell cycle. The same process happens during binary fission in prokaryotes. This happens so that one DNA molecule can stay with the parent cell and one DNA molecule can go to the daughter cell produced by mitosis. The first task that the cell has to complete is unwinding the double helix and it does so with the help of the enzyme helicase. The unwinding action of helicase is going to be counteracted by that of the enzyme topoisomerase, which unwinds the opposite way to relieve the stress caused by helicase. Next up, the cell has to know where to start DNA replication, which is done through the addition of RNA primers by the enzyme primase. They're added through complementary base pairing, and they indicate where nucleotides need to be added. It's important to note that new nucleotides or base pairs can only be added to the hydroxyl group of a 3' end, and this is what DNA polymerase does. It adds nucleotides in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So as you can see for the top strand, that is no problem since 5' prime to 3' prime is the same direction that the helicase is traveling, which in this physical diagram is from right to left. In the bottom strand, DNA polymerase also acts in 5' prime to 3' prime direction of the new strand being synthesized, and as you can see, this will always leave a gap since helicase will keep unwinding and DNA can only work in the opposite direction of helicase. Because of these differences between the top strand and the bottom strand in this diagram come the terms leading strand and lagging strand. As the helicase keeps unwinding more DNA, the lagging strand will produce separate DNA fragments since DNA can only work opposite the helicase. These separate pieces of DNA are called Okazaki fragments and only exist in the lagging strand. Thankfully, we have an enzyme called DNA ligase that adds nucleotides to the gaps between the different Okazaki fragments. And I forgot to mention this in the diagram, but there's also an enzyme that removes the RNA primers and replaces them with DNA. Now we're going to take a look at which learning objectives we have already covered. We talked about the cell cycle in the beginning. We also spoke about how helicase separates the DNA strand, how both strands are replicated in the 5' to 3' prime direction, and what that means in terms of leading and lagging. We also spoke about primers, and we spoke about Okazaki fragments. Now we're going to talk about this concept of the replication fork, which is basically the kind of horizontal Y shape that is formed when helicase unwinds the double helix. But if you imagine the DNA molecule when this all started, the helicase that we have drawn basically started a hole and started replicating the DNA to the left of this origin. However, we want to replicate the whole DNA molecule, so there will be a helicase and a topoisomerase on the right side of the origin, and this whole process will happen for this side as well. This means that for every DNA replication event, there are actually two replication forks. We already determined which is the leading strand and which is the lagging strand for the replication fork on the left, but on the right, it's going to be different because of the directionality of the end of the DNA on the right. To determine which are the leading strands, we just see which of the new strands is synthesized in the direction that the helicase is moving. For the left side, we already determined it's the top strand, and for the right side, it's going to be the bottom strand, as you can see here. For the lagging strand, you just recognize which newly synthesized strand is moving opposite to the helicase in its replication fork. Now we already covered the learning objective about labeling leading and lagging strand in replication forks. This second to last learning objective I checked off here is actually not tested in 2020 winter session, so don't worry about it. 
Now on to the last one. We're going to have to dig up a bit of our knowledge from midterm one because it asks about non-covalent interactions. This learning objective is asking you to predict the types of non-covalent interactions that can happen between a nucleotide because that's basically what DNA is made of and different proteins involved in DNA replication. Now for this we need to look at really specific molecules because since all the proteins involved in DNA replication are quite large, as a whole they can't be completely polar or completely nonpolar. So they would have to give you a specific amino acid that is present within that protein because any protein can have both polar amino acids, nonpolar, positively charged, or negatively charged. Now we know what DNA nucleotides are made of, so that is how we can predict non-covalent interactions. We know that the sugar group, which is a carbohydrate, is polar. So for example, between a polar amino acid in DNA polymerase and the sugar in the nucleotide, you could form a PD-PD interaction. The nitrogenous bases, so adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, are nonpolar. So with a nonpolar amino acid, they could form, for example, an ID-ID interaction. Note that the bases can also form hydrogen bonds, since hydrogen bonds between them are what hold the double helix together. And we know that the phosphate group is <clears throat> ionic, since it has that negative charge on the oxygen on the left. So with a positively charged amino acid, it could form an ion-ion bond. However, there can also be different mixes of these bonds. So, for example, between the sugar in the nucleotide and a nonpolar amino acid in DNA polymerase, you could form a PDID bond. Or between the phosphate group in the nucleotide and a polar amino acid in DNA polymerase, you could form a PD ion interaction. The system will always try to create the most strong bond out of these options. The second type of DNA replication we're going to be talking about is DNA in vitro, also known as polymerase chain reaction. These are the learning objectives that we're going to be covering in this part, and they're all the ones in Unit 2.2. The objective of PCR is basically to replicate in a laboratory setting what occurs in a cell in DNA replication, but do it much faster so that it can be used to amplify a specific sequence. This sequence to be amplified is your target sequence, and the materials that you will need to put into your thermocycler is tag polymerase, which is a type of DNA polymerase that is heat resistant because it's extracted from hot springs actually, some primers, and what are called DNTPs. These are nucleotides, so for example, a uh, DATP is a nucleotide with an adenine on it, a uh, DTTP is a nucleotide with a thymine on it, and so on. If we look at the learning objectives, we'll see that we already covered the one about PCR components and the role of DNTPs. The first step of PCR is denaturation, where the temperature is increased to 95 degrees Celsius. The temperature is increased because heat can break very strong bonds, and this is the case with DNA because heat breaks the hydrogen bonds that hold the two strands together, hence doing the job that helicase does in cells. Then comes annealing where the temperature is lowered to allow for DNA primers to bind by themselves. Then the temperature is increased to the optimal temperature in which tag polymerase works, which is around 72 degrees Celsius. And here is where TAC polymerase does the job of DNA polymerase by adding the DNTPs the way DNA polymerase does. So you guys get a picture of what kind of applications there are for this because it is a really common tool used in the lab. Many SARS-CoV-2 tests are done with PCR. So the target sequence in this case is the N gene which codes for the virus's nucleocapsid. The whole genome isn't used because it's about 30,000 base pairs and that's way too much to be feasible. So after about 30 to 40 PCR cycles, there are 34 billion copies of the DNA molecule made. And at this stage, it has been amplified enough to be able to do fluorescent testing to determine if the patient has COVID or not. This process of PCR can be used to amplify the genome 
of eukaryotes and prokaryotes alike, and even viruses, as you can see here. The last three learning objectives we're going to address using examples from class. So this is a question from your Unit 2.2 quiz on Achieve. It's showing you this target sequence that you want to amplify and asking you what primers you would use to amplify. So first of all, we're going to separate the two strands so we can see everything better and be able to write out the complementary sequences more comfortably. I'm now labeling the directionality of the hypothetical primers. It's just a complementary directionality to the existing strands. And since I know that tag polymerase will work from 5' prime to 3' prime end, just like DNA polymerase, I can kind of make it travel down each of these sequences. And if in its path it covers all of the target sequence, then I know it will be able to amplify the sequence. And if it just kind of travels off the sequence, away from it, then I know that it will probably not be good to amplify the sequence. So this is how we recognize that the top right and the bottom left are the primers we need to use. However, we cannot use the sequence that's on the screen. We need to make the sequence that's complementary to it. So we just do this by pairing A to, A to T and C to G and having the opposite directionality. This second example is from the Unit 2.2 practice questions, which can be found in the student drive folder. So in this question, all the letters are different primers that exist for the DNA sequence that's in the middle. The first question is asking that if you use primer A, which of the other primers will yield the smallest DNA product? So if you use A and which other primer will you make the smallest sequence? So if we look at the trajectory that A will cover and then test it against the trajectory of each of the primers that is on the opposite strand, here we can see that, that if you use primers A and C, you will yield the smallest possible DNA product. Then the second question is asking that if you use primer B, which of the primers will not produce a product? All of the primers opposite to it can yield a viable product since they are on the opposite strand. But primer A, for example, since it's on the same strand as B, will not yield a viable product. So now if we go to the learning objectives, we can see that we have now covered all of them. So this will be the end of the DNA replication in vitro segment. Finally, now we can compare DNA replication in vivo and in vitro. In terms of location, it varies in vivo depending on the kind of organism. So for eukaryotes, the location of DNA replication is in the nucleus since this is where all the genetic material is located. In prokaryotes, it is the nuclear region since there is no nucleus. In vitro, this simply happens in the thermal cycle, which is the lab apparatus. Then in terms of the primer used to begin DNA replication, in vivo it is an RNA primer that's later replaced with DNA and in vitro, it is just straight up DNA. In vivo, we talked about the different enzymes involved, including DNA polymerase, DNA ligase, helicase, top isomerase, and primase. In vitro, the only enzyme used is tag polymerase to do the function of DNA polymerase, since all the other ones are replaced by synthetic primers or DNTP. In terms of continuity, there is unproblematic continuous replication in the leading strand in vivo, and in the lagging strand there is segmented replication that is later solved. On the other hand, in PCR, replication is continuous everywhere. Now we have covered the final learning objective for DNA replication. Thank you so much for watching, and if you want more, you can watch my videos on transcription and operons and translation.